Greetings and welcome back. We are in Senior English A, and our objective now for the hour is to address Act 5, and especially Scene 1 of Shakespeare's great tragedy, Macbeth. I want to begin by making a quick observation about the movement of characterization. Okay, now I'll be coming back to this in a later observation comment on the play Hamlet. Shakespeare, in many ways, will drive his plot through powerful characters. So this is the first thing you want to say in your notes. Shakespeare is very much about the development of characters, and he wants you, by the way, that's why these plays take so long. I mean, if you go and watch a play of Shakespeare's, usually you're spending at least two hours in the theater. The reason for the length is so that he can really develop these characters, so that we will watch these characters in their movements. Let's think about, for example, Lady Macbeth, shall we? Lady Macbeth will open for us in 1-5, come onto the stage alone, that's significant. She will spend much, it's, a, it's clear she spends much of her time alone. She's reading a letter from her husband Macbeth, who informs her about those three witches and their prophecies. And then in a remarkable soliloquy in the very beginning, when we meet her for the very first time, she says it out loud. You will be king. Right. And yet she says, I fear that your nature is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure you're man enough, tough enough, wicked enough to get the, to get the throne the fastest way. Well, now that's interesting because this is the same guy who will become king and then will slaughter everyone in Macduff's house. If that's called being too full of the milk of human kindness, I don't want to meet a villain, right? The downfall of Macbeth in large measure is mirrored in reverse by Lady Macbeth. I'll say that again. The downfall of Macbeth is mirrored in reverse by Lady Macbeth. At the beginning of the play, Macbeth is no villain. Lady Macbeth is. And that's pretty obvious. I mean, right from the start. She will call her house a Holiday Inn where they're going to take care of Duncan that evening. Not only are they going to slaughter him, they're going to do it in their own house. And Lady Macbeth is the driving force behind these actions. When her husband begins to show weakness, she will be the one that says, infirm of purpose. That's a derisive comment. It's not, yeah, you're a, you're a wimp, yay, I got a wimp for a guy. No, this is in fact quite the opposite. She's the villain. And in many ways, Macbeth is perceived as being heroic right up until he's not. By Act 5, Scene 1, we're going to see one of the most compelling visual scenes you'll ever see in all of Shakespeare's canon. You will begin with a doctor and his nurse. This doctor will represent the foil or the opposite to the doctor that we saw in the previous scene. You'll remember that long scene where down in England, Malcolm and Macduff are having a conversation and the doctor comes in and he talks about, oh, it's great to be a doctor in England right now because we have such a great king. It's almost as if no one gets sick anymore. And if anybody gets sick, our king is so remarkable that actually they get well really fast. In other words, if you have a healthy king, a good king, you have a healthy, a good state. Scotland is completely the opposite. And notice right away the opening lines. The doctor will say, I have two nights watched with you, but can perceive no truth in your report. When was it she last walked? Now, of course, Shakespeare, I've said this before, he loves what we call the vague antecedent. Just to do a quick grammar lesson here, we use pronouns all the time. But we have rules in the English language about these pronouns. So, for example, if I were to say to Mr. Frederick, uh, give me that. Mr. Frederick knows that the word that, which is a pronoun, is referring to something. By the way, can you do that for me? Give me that. See, he's starting to look around. 
He doesn't know specifically what that I'm in reference to. Or I could say to Mr. Ramos, isn't she amazing? Well, do you think she is, by the way? See, here's the problem for Ramos. He's known one or two she's. And to call her amazing or not will depend entirely on, are you ready for this? The antecedent, that which comes before, ante, A-N-T-E. The thing that's being referenced when you use a pronoun. Shakespeare loves to begin scenes with a vague, unclear antecedent. Notice what he just said. He says, I've been watching for two nights about this report. He says, when was it she last walked? She who? And then it hits you. There aren't very many she's in this play. One of them has now been slaughtered, right, by, uh, by Macbeth's um, henchman. Lady Macduff is now killed. The only other she's, well, you remember, Banquio said, I'd call you witches except for what? What did he say? I'd call you witches except for you have this kind of facial hair thing going on, and you look more male than you look female. Can't really call you witches. A way to say witches are something different. They are unnatural, we might say. Well, the only other she, obviously, is Lady Macbeth, and then it hits us. When was the last time we saw Lady Macbeth? Oh, no, that's an intriguing question. When was the last... By the way, you can, I don't expect you to know this play that well, so you can start flipping backwards through your pages to see the last time that we saw Lady Macbeth on stage. Go ahead, take a look. It's fascinating, the last time. And you can start walking yourself back through the play and say, did we see her in Act 4? We didn't see her in Act 4, did we? Act 4 began, you'll remember, with the return to the witches, the prophesying of the three witches that, you know, beware Macduff, beware the Thane of Fife, all that stuff. We didn't see her in Act 4. When did we see her last? Did we see her in Act 3? What was going on in Act 3 when we saw her for the last time? Do you remember? When did we see this woman for the last time? See, because all of a sudden, this is what Shakespeare wants you to do. An intelligent audience viewer will say, when was it she last walked? And we're in the middle of the night, by the way. We're in the middle of the night. And the doctor is saying, I've been watching for two nights trying to see this woman walking. I don't understand. Walking? Lady Macbeth has been walking every time we saw her walk on stage. What's going on? Well, guess what? Lady Macbeth is sleepwalking. Now, what does that mean? Sleepwalking. Are you familiar with this concept? You fall, asleep you fall asleep, but you're not actually asleep. So much so that your body gets up and walks around. You are in a half-conscious, unconscious state. And when we see Lady Macbeth come on stage, you, do you remember the last time she spoke? What was it that she said? I'm being very intentional here for a reason. What was the last thing Lady Macbeth said when she was on stage for the last time? Shakespeare, again, is going to play games with an audience that will read these plays later. Do you remember what it is that she said to her husband about what it is that he needed more than anything? She will say it. You just need to sleep. Dude, if you could just sleep, the world would be so much better. Darkly ironic, Lady Macbeth has been sleeping, but she hasn't been. And this report has come to the doctor, and now we get to see it on stage. And it is provocative. When you watch a good actress come on stage playing Lady Macbeth, are you ready for this? Two things for your notes. One, Mama's lost it. She's gone nuts. She's, she's lost her mind. It's pretty clear that something's going on with Mama's psyche. Secondly, are you ready for this? Keller, she comes on stage doing one of these right here. Like washing her hands over and over again. She'll rub them and wash them and, and do one of these. And then she'll go back like she's washing them again. And then she'll rub them. And then she'll do some more of this. And while she does this, she starts talking. Her voice is moving. Her eyes are like asleep. This is the closest thing we've got to zombie mode. Shakespeare, in many ways, is going to play the case of the zombie mode. That is to say, alive, but not alive. But her mind is active enough that she's talking, and what she says, quite radical. Like, I wouldn't have thought the old man to have so much blood. Whoa, 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 what does that mean? I wouldn't have thought the old man to have so much blood. What could she be talking about there? 
Immediately, immediately the doctor recognizes, whoa, 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 this is not good. What she's saying shouldn't be heard. And he will say as much to the nurse, you shouldn't be here to hear this. The nurse will respond, yeah, she's talking too much. It's not me, it's her. She's the one. In the end, the doctor in this scene will point out, I got nothing to help with this. This is a sickness of the mind, not of the body. Lady Macbeth has lost her mind. And in this moment, she becomes for us pathetic. She is no longer that strong woman who came on stage in 1-5 who said, you will be king and all. No, she's not that woman. She is a completely broken woman. What point is Shakespeare making? What point is Shakespeare making as you watch this really strong, powerful woman come onto the stage like a loon? Crazy. She is broken. She's lost her mind. And are you ready for this? In a few more minutes, off stage, she will scream. And it'll be over. Why? She does. She kills herself. She takes her own life. Yeah, she takes her, she takes her, she does. She commits suicide, doesn't she? She takes her own life, doesn't she, right? So this is the direction. Now, to return to what I said before, Shakespeare loves to develop characters. At the beginning of our play, Hamlet begins, or I'm sorry, Macbeth begins heroic, Lady Macbeth villainous. By the end of the play, these two characters will have switched roles in many ways. It's not that we're going to see Lady Macbeth as anything close to heroic. But we are going to see her as pathetic. It's kind of sad. In other words, whoa, this strong and tough woman, it's over. She's got nothing anymore. And we're only getting ready for what's coming. As we know, this is going to kind of prefigure what's about to happen with Macbeth as well. Things are not going well, we might say, you know, in Scotland. All right, here we go. Let's go ahead and watch and listen. Act 5, C1. Hope this doesn't freak you out too badly. All right, follow along. Take a look at all the things she says, by the way. I have two nights watched with you, but can perceive no truth in your report. When was it she last walked? Since his majesty went into the field, I have seen her rise from her bed, throw a nightgown upon her, unlock her closet, take forth paper, fold it, write upon it, read it, afterwards seal it, and again return to bed. Yet all this while in a most fast sleep. A great perturbation in nature to receive at once the benefit of sleep and do the effects of watching. In this slumbery agitation, besides her walking and other actual performances, what at any time have you heard her say? That's which I will not report after her. You may to me, and tis most meet you should. Neither to you nor anyone have no witness to confirm my speech. Here are you. Here she comes. Ah, right, here you go. This is her very guise, and upon my life fast asleep. Observe her. Stand close. She has light by her continually, it is her command. She hates the darkness, her eyes are open. Aye, but their sense is shut. What is it she does now? Look how she rubs her hands. It is an accustomed action with her to see thus washing her hands. I have known her continuing this a quarter of an hour. Shh. Here we go. Soldier in the field? What need we fear? Who knows it? <coughs> and none can call our power to account. Oh, 
Yet who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? Do you mark that? A thane of Fife had a wife. Where is she now? Thane of Fife, Lady Macduff. What will these hands never be clean? Don't water that, my lord, don't water that. Your model is starting. Go to, go to, you have known what you should not. Yes, but what she should not, I'm sure of that. <laughs> Can't get the smell of the blood from out of her nostrils. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. Oh. 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 A broken woman. my practice, yet I have known those which walked in their sleep, who have died holily in their beds. Wash your hands, put on a nightgown, look not so pale, I tell you yet again, Banquo's buried, he cannot come out of his grave. Look at these lights. What's done cannot be undone. That's the key of the whole play, huh? Referencing my mind, she has mated. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm asking for a specific game where the word mate is used. Does anyone chess. know? I'm sorry. Chess. It is the game of chess. Outstanding, Mr. Frederick. The argument here is, in other words, in the game of chess, you are you lose the game when you are checkmated. That is to say, your king is put in a position on the board where the king can move no place because uh, no available squares, and that we call checkmate, abbreviated mate. And so to say my mind she has mated means I'm, I have no answer. I cannot tell you what really is going on. He says about her, she has more need of the divine. What does that mean? She doesn't need a doctor, she needs a what? Your sidebar will give you some observations of this. She needs, she needs a priest. In other words, she's seriously jacked up. Notice finally on page 412, foul, <laughs> do you see the word? It's as if Shakespeare wants us to make sure that we didn't miss fair is foul and foul is fair. Do you see it uh, at line 58? Foul whisperings are abroad. What does that mean? In the state of Scotland, everybody's what? There's talking, talking, bad talking or good talking? It's all gossip, bad gossip, right? Gossip, talking. Foul whisperings are abroad. 
unnatural deeds do breed unnatural troubles. In other words, in the end, Shakespeare's Hamlet will have it this way. Foul deeds will rise, though all the earth overwhelm them to men's eyes. It's a great word picture. You take seed, throw it in the ground, cover it. You got no idea what, was the, what those seeds were going to grow. But don't worry, enough time, it's going to come up out of the ground. It's inevitable. You're going to find out what went wrong. In other words, in the end, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, they cannot get away with the terrible things that they've done. Indeed, minds to their death pillows will discharge their secrets. If you do unnatural deeds, you can't sleep at night well. Notice Lady Macbeth, she cannot sleep. Oh, yeah, what was she carrying with her? She was carrying a candle with her. How come do you imagine she's carrying a candle? Now, I don't understand this. Help me understand. She ain't got no blood on her hands. Why is she, why is she, what blood is on her hands? I mean, I don't understand. She clearly got all the blood off her hands. Guilt, isn't it? You got it. It's the guilt, isn't it? It's the psychological guilt. She can commit the act along with her husband, but she can't get away from the guilt. What was the other sense that she comments on? She can what? She smells what? And there are, in fact, committed and convicted cri uh, criminals who are murderers who will report 20 years later. I once interviewed a, uh, a convicted uh, uh, felon who had shot two cops at cl very close range. Uh, and he said that was the thing he, 20 years later, he said he still, every night when he laid down and shut his eyes, he immediately could remember the smell uh, uh, in the situation. The smell of the gunpowder, the smell of the blood. And he said, there's no getting away from it. There's nothing I can do. I've tried everything, he said. I've tried every kind of drug imaginable. It doesn't matter. I can still smell it, and it haunts me every single night of my life. The smell won't go away. Fascinating. Shakespeare playing a similar game. Now, 5-2, and, and, and I'm, I'm with you on page 413, and I want you to just look at this with me for a second. And we're just going to flip through now the rest of the play, because I need you to have a sense of what's about to happen. Shakespeare's play is ostensibly done. All we got to do now is to get to the end and the final scene between Macbeth and Macduff. The way we're going to get there is a series of very brief scenes, and that's kind of why I want to point this out to you. Look at on page 413, scene two, you're going to have a group of soldiers and they are marching from England towards Scotland, okay? There will be a few comments made about how excited they are to fight Macbeth. And then we're on to page 414 and scene 3, where we're not with the soldiers in England moving towards Scotland. We're in Macbeth's castle, where in Macbeth's castle, Macbeth will be getting the reports that a large number of troops are coming from England towards Scotland. How do you imagine Macbeth is going to feel about that? There's a huge army coming, marching against his castle. What will be his view of that? Well, interestingly, he's going to fake like he's not worried. He's going to rely on a prophecy that was recently given to him. What was that prophecy, do you remember? As long as the trees don't jump up and march against your castle, you are fine. We'll also have some interesting uh, moments here uh, on, pay, on page five, uh, 415 as Macbeth has to decide, is he going to stay in his castle or is he going to leave? Then we're back, scene four. Do you see it on 416? We'll obviously go through these, but I'm just pointing it out to you. Then we're back on 416. We're back to, again, a little bit of our, uh, a, a, a little observation of our soldiers one more time. Then we're back to scene five. Five, five, you'll have Macbeth, and uh, we'll be back in Macbeth's castle. Then five, six, well, here we are again in front of the castle. Five, seven, we're going to, uh, we're going to have the first of the fights. And finally, 5-8, you can see it, Macbeth and Macduff, are, uh, Macduff come face to face and they have their famous fight and that's the end of it. Got me? Okay. So uh, the point I want to make is Act 5 is constructed as a series now of brief scenes where we move back and forth between two places. One, 
were with the English troops traveling with Malcolm to were with Macbeth in his castle at Inverness. And we're going to move back and forth and back and forth. All right? All right, let's go to it. 4 2, uh, uh, 5 2, real quickly. And let's just point out that we've got a series now of observations made by the uh, soldiers. Notice at line 12, Mentius, one of the English soldiers, will ask, What does the tyrant? They don't even talk about Macbeth in his name anymore, they call him a tyrant. Okay? When we hear that word, tyrant, good or bad? Yeah, not really good at all. Notice. Uh, the, um, we're told Great Dunsany, his castle, he strongly fortifies. In other words, he's got this huge castle and he's getting ready for an assault by us. Look at it. Some say, are you ready for this? Some say he's mad. Others that lesser hate him do call it valiant fury. So let's just point it out. Both mama and daddy they're losing it, aren't they, right? We've just seen Lady Macbeth. She's going nuts. And they're already saying it out loud. Macbeth is a whack job, serious whack job. Now, we haven't seen Macbeth. Interestingly, we haven't seen Macbeth since he left those, four, those three witches and those four prophecies, remember, at the beginning of Act 4. Shakespeare, by the way, will do this intentionally, where he'll give his actor who plays Macbeth a little bit of time off stage to just kind of rest and relax a little bit before he comes on stage for the fifth act and, of course, those final scenes. Look at the next line. Now, look at what Angus, another English uh, warrior, says. Now, I'm on page 413, line 17 or so. Now does he feel his secret murders sticking on his hands. What's interesting about that language? Sticking on his hands. This is that image of blood, right? One of the powerful images of this play is early on when Macbeth comes on stage and he's got blood on his hands, right? And you'll remember Lady Macbeth says a little water cleanses us of the deed. In other words, what? All you got to do is what? Wash your hands. Come on, dude. It's not that big of a deal. The point here is that you can take the literal blood off the hands, but you cannot remove what? The mental blood. Yeah, the, the, the guilt associated. Notice. Now, my, uh, uh, now minutely revolts upbraid his faith breach. Those he commands move only in command, nothing in love. It points out that Macbeth never became a king worthy of the love and admiration of his people. The only reason they follow him is what? Fear. Yeah, they're afraid because they know if you, if you, you, know, if you cross him, he's going to jack you. And that's the only time. Notice, now does he feel his title hang loose about him. And now we're back to the garment theme again. And in fact, when we see Macbeth, here coming up in just a moment, when we see Macbeth, we're going to see him in his, in his robe, but it isn't going to fit him very well. An actor who knows this play well, who plays the role of Macbeth, will always be doing one of these in the fifth act. It's like and it'll be pushing his crown up on his head. In other words, physically, he is uncomfortable in the garment of kingship. It doesn't fit him. And the, and the observation here is made as well. All right, so Shakespeare likes to begin to kind of finish up with some of his major themes as he hits the fifth act. All right, here we go. We'll listen now to five, two. <laughs> The English power is near, led on by Malcolm, his uncle Seward, and the good Macduff. Revenge is burning them, for their dear causes would to the pleading and the grim alarm excite the mortified man. They are gone on wood, so we well beat them. That's why they're coming. Who knows if Dumblebane be with his brother? For certain, sir, he is not. I have a file of all the gentry. There is Seward's son and many unruff youths that even now protest their thirst of manhood. What does the title? Great Dunsany, he strongly fortifies. Some say he's mad. Others, the lesser hate him, to call it valiant fury. But for certain, he cannot buckle his distempered cause within the belt of rule. Now does he feel his secret murders sticking on his hands. Thou minutely revolts upbraid his faith breach. Those he commands move only in command, nothing in love. Now does he feel his title hang loose about him like a giant's robe upon a dwarfish thief. Who then shall blame his pestered senses to recoil from Stark, when all that is within him does condemn itself for being there? Well, march we on. 
to give obedience what is truly owed. Meet we the medicine of the sickly wheel, and with him pour we in our country's purge each drop of us. Or so much as it needs to dew the sovereign flower and drown the weeds. Make we our march towards Burnham. And see what Shakespeare's got to do. Remember, guys, he's putting this play on a stage, right? So he's got to be able to create the illusion of where he is. And so this allows the audience to know, oh, 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 I get it. So these guys are not yet in Scotland. They're marching towards Macbeth's castle, Inverness, sitting atop what hill? Dunsinane. What's the wood sitting at the bottom of that hill? Brynham Woods. So you've got here, that's where we're headed. We're headed to the woods right at the bottom of the hill there where, she, where uh, Macbeth's castle is. All right, here we go now, 5-3. What is Macbeth like as we see him now for uh, some of the last times in the play? Notice he begins by saying, Bring me no more reports. Let them fly all. Reports? Reports about what? What is it that Macbeth does not want to hear any more about? He does not want to hear any more about guys coming to remove him from his, from his position of power. Notice what he says. Brutal irony. Till Burnham would remove to Dunsinane, I cannot taint with fear. In other words, what's he say? Until the trees jump out of the ground and start marching up the hill against my castle, I am not going to have to worry about anything. I won't be afraid. Right? Notice he says, what's the boy Malcolm? Was he not born of woman? Uh-oh, what's he referencing here? The prophecy that you don't have to ever worry about anyone born of a woman. Wasn't Malcolm born of a woman? Certainly he was. I have no one to fear. The spirits that know all mortal consequences have pronounced me thus. Fear not, Macbeth. No man that's born of woman shall e'er have power over thee. Then fly, false thanes, and mingle with the English epicures. The mind I sway by and the heart I bear shall never sag with doubt nor shake with fear. Do you remember what Macbeth said in Act 4? I am seeing now who read closely. Do you remember what Macbeth said in Act 4 when he was looking for the witches and immediately they were gone? Infected on the air they ride and what? Damned all those who, what did he say, Mr. Keeley? Damned all those who believe in them. <laughs> so, a dark irony here. Macbeth says, if you believe in witches, you're going to get jacked. I don't have to worry, he says, because the witches promised me I would be safe. Just a dark irony. So, you can kind of watch the fall of Macbeth happen. Onto the stage will come a servant, and he's going to report, ha, ha, ha. We, there's uh, there's 10,000, and Macbeth will interrupt him. What, geese? Uh, no, soldiers. 10,000 soldiers are coming. Macbeth himself, you will see, he will refuse to be worried, but you know that he's worried. Do you know what I mean? It's like you can kind of tell something's up. Uh... Then Macbeth is left alone for a few seconds. Do you see it on page 414? Macbeth will say, I am sick at heart. When I behold, and then he has to call for his guy again, Seton, this push will cheer me ever or deceit me now. And then look at what he says. I've lived long enough. My way of life has fallen into the sear, the yellow leaf. And that which should accompany old age is honor, love, obedience, troops of friends. I must not look to have, but in their stead, curses, not loud, but deep, mouth honor, Breath which the poor heart would fain deny and dare not. This is a provocative insight. What does he say about his life? He pictures himself like a leaf that once was green, and now it's turned yellow, meaning what? It's soon going to fall off the tree and fall. And he points out that the life he has is not the life he should have had. The life he should have had says it should have been filled with honor, I got no honor. Nobody even cares. Then onto the stage will come Seton, and uh, Macbeth will say, "I'll fight till from my bones the flesh be hacked. Give me my armor." And for the and then all of a sudden it hits you. Oh yeah, the last time you saw Macbeth in armor was when he got those first prophecies from those witches, and he came on stage and said, "So foul and fair a day I've not seen." He hasn't been in armor since then. What happens next is really darkly ironic and humorous. They'll bring on armor, and they try and put it on him. But Macbeth has grown fat 
in the time that he has been king because always